everybody. Thanks for tuning in to The Path of Me. I'm your host, Wendy Hutchinson. And today my guest is one of my favorite people in the whole world. It's um, my dad. His name is Nelson Markle. And he's had such an interesting life. I had to have him on the show. So welcome, dad. How are you? I'm just great. Thanks. I wanted to ask you what it was like growing up in Hawaii in the 50s. Ah, well, you know, it's interesting. I must be one of the last of the generation that in my early life, we had no TV. (laughs) So we got to listen to the radio, to really interesting things like Flash Gordon, uh, The Shadow, Inner Sanctum, things like that. That's super cool. I think the first time I saw TV was in 1952. Were you in the mainland at the time, or were you in... We were, at the time, relocating from Hawaii to Pennsylvania. So you were in Pennsylvania when you saw TV for the first time? Ah, we were in transit. We were in San Francisco, actually. Wow, that must have been cool for you. It was very cool. How old were you? I was six. And so you guys, your dad was in the military. He was military. He was a lifetime army guy. Okay. And so he got transferred. And did you guys go to the mainland by ship? Were you on a boat? Actually, we flew uh, from Hickam Air Force Base to a military base. I think it was Travis in California. And then we had to go into temporary housing while we waited for our car which came up by naval vessel. So we were there, oh, probably a little over a week waiting to get our car. And then you guys drove across the country to Pennsylvania. We did. We actually drove from San Francisco down to Los Angeles to see my mom's sister. And then from Los Angeles to Ohio to see another of her sisters before finally getting to Pennsylvania. It was a long trip wow. in 1952. You guys went all the way across the country. They did. Most of it was along the old Route uh, 66. Remember that, uh, Route 66? Yeah. 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 What was it like being in a, on a road trip that long? Did you go crazy? You're only six. Well, you know, uh, Dad being an Army guy didn't put up with any kind of craziness. He was pretty from, strict. Yeah, he was, he was a master sergeant in the army. And he didn't there was no bullshit in your, car, in your car, no whining. No whininess permitted. So, yeah, so they had games and coloring books and stuff like that for us to, to play with. Yeah. And, and then it was an old um, Kaiser Traveler and the back seat folded down so that we had, you know, the whole back was like, you know, a station wagon with the seats folded down. Yeah, kind of yeah. like that. So we got So no, um, there was definitely no seat belts back then. <laughs> no seat belts. <laughs> you're no the dice. Belts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was interesting uh, when you're little, six years old, uh, a couple of things come to mind when I heard my parents talking about the Golden Gate Bridge and was so looking forward to seeing gold that I was terribly disappointed when we went across the bridge and there was no gold. <laughs> I know it's a literal world when you're little also. When you're six, and then they talked about having to catch a ferry, and in my mind it was a ferry, right. and I couldn't imagine how a little ferry was going to carry a big <laughs> car across this river. <laughs> but you soon, you learned. Right. I think you also had a you thought you were actually going to get a monkey at one point. Uh, my mom's sister worked uh, in a circus. She was an accountant, and her husband, my Uncle Bobby, was in charge of setting up all the rigging at the circus. So if they were in a tent, he was responsible for putting up the tent and all of the tight ropes and all that kind of tight wires and all that stuff. Um, anyway, they, they talked, you know, they had monkeys that performed. Right. And so, they, I was little, and they said, of course, you know, I always wanted a monkey. 
<laughs> so I was so excited that he said I could get a monkey. And it was a rubber blow up monkey. I was so disappointed. <laughs> You were robbed. Being crushed. I was crushed. <laughs> oh my God. So you finally you finally made it to your destination with your family to Pennsylvania. The first time you probably saw snow. And it was. Weather, experienced cold weather. It was. And how many years did you guys spend in Pennsylvania? Well, let me think. Um, we were there about four years. Yeah. yeah. So from 52 to 56. And then, interestingly, my dad got transferred again since he was still in the Army. And lo and behold, he was transferred back to Hawaii. Wow. That must so, be great for your mom because all of her family was there. She correct. Was half Hawaiian and half Chinese, so she had a lot of siblings, cousins, her parents. Were her parents still alive at that time? Oh yeah, yep, yep. Although um, my grandfather died, uh, let's see, he died actually right before we moved back to Hawaii. And then my grandmother died several years after we got back. To Didn't you have an interesting experience around that? Uh, actually, my cousin, I had a first cousin who experienced strange things. <laughs> yeah. well, she, and she wasn't living with you until you went back. Well, actually, this cousin um, had to undergo open heart surgery. And it was her mother who was married to the circus guy. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, they traveled constantly. And because of her surgery, she couldn't travel with them. So she came to live with us. And How old were you when she came to live with you? Well, let me think. Um, I was probably eight or nine, maybe 10, eight or nine, somewhere in that range. And, uh, so you were still in Pennsylvania then? When she yes, came? yes. So when we moved back, she moved with us. Again. Okay, okay. So she had open heart surgery, and I think she had a near-death experience, didn't she? She did. She did. Um, she, uh, well, apparently from what I heard from my mom was uh, while she was in surgery um, or in going to recovery, they, they actually pronounced her dead. And then as they were you know, prepping to take her down to the morgue, I assume she came back. <laughs> and uh, it must have been a surprise for the orderly. <laughs> yeah, surprised everybody. Oh but uh, subsequently, when you talked to her during that period, she talked about the fact that my grandfather, who had died, um, had come together. She was the eldest female first cousin, of all the first cousins, she was the eldest. And my grandparents used to take care of her a lot. And so she was very close to my grandfather. Anyway, she said that he came for her and told her it was time to go to sleep. He was Chinese. Mm -hmm. And when she was little, he used to sing Chinese lullabies to put her to sleep. Oh. And uh, so apparently he was singing with her. And they went off, and she looked back. She could see herself on the, the bed, and all she could name who was around the bed at the time, and mm -hmm. where they were. And then she said they got to this, she said, a gate, a garden, and she couldn't go any further. And before she knew it, she was waking up. She was back in her body. That's amazing. Ah, really amazing. God. So you came back to Hawaii with your family, and I know just a couple short years later, your dad died at the age of 12, right? Right. And uh, we moved back in 56. In 1958, he died of a sudden heart attack. So you were the oldest boy. You have an older sister. Right. Two years, but 
That must have, did you feel a lot of responsibility? Like all of a sudden you had to kind of step up in some way or? I don't know if I felt that so much. Um, I knew that uh, we never had any money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, anything I could do to help earn money was going to be helpful. So I started going around the neighborhood soliciting lawn mowing jobs. And I would, on the weekends, would all my lawn were all over the neighborhood mowing lawns and weeding for a dollar an hour. <laughs> oh my gosh, Dad. Your mom must have been so proud of you, like, that you were doing that at such an early age. And then did you have a paper route after that, or were you? No, I did not. But as mom? soon as I was old enough, uh, I went to work at a service station. So I must have been about 15, I think, when I first started working at the service station, which didn't pay a whole lot better than mowing lawn. But I did get more hours. I'm <laughs> still right. working for a dollar an hour. Right. Yeah. It was the going rate, I guess. It was the going rate. Yeah. I, I'm curious. Now, how old were you when you got into martial arts? I was, well, as soon as we moved back from Pennsylvania, so that would have been in 56, so I would have been 10. Um, my mom wanted to get me into judo because I was always little, and she was always afraid bigger kids would pick on me. Sure. So she got me into uh, judo. So I started judo at uh, 10 years old. Yeah, and then you ended up being a double black belt, I think. Well, the dojo I belonged to belonged to two different organizations. One was the American Judo and Jiu-Jitsu Institute, and the other was the Kodokan School of Judo. And so I ended up getting a black belt from each organization. Wow. Oh, how long did that take? Oh, it took, seemed like forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were. They didn't give it out willy nilly. You had to really sure. learn. And so, uh, but yeah, so I was in it anyway from ten to about uh, seventeen, I would think, seventeen or eighteen. And uh, yeah. So you were also teaching, I think. Right, and, you know, once you get uh, a certain rank, then the, the sensei would ask you to teach the, the younger kids coming in, and so that's what I did. Is that how you met mom? Actually, it was. Her younger brothers signed up, and so we started teaching them. They were in a class, obviously, mm -hmm. and then uh, since she was driving, she'd come to pick them up, and he said, ooh, who is that? So I met kind of cute. Yeah, so I, you know, I obviously treated the two boys well. I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> she probably looked forward to picking them up, too. Uh, I don't know. Two-way street there. So you went to public high school. You guys, like you said, were a very modest means. Right. And as you got closer to, um, you played football as well, right? I did, yeah. Um, I was small, but I was fast. <laughs> so you got to be fast if you don't want to get crunched all the time. Yeah. yeah so, so you yeah. were the captain of the football team, right? I was co-captain. There were two of us. A guy named Bobby Richardson and I were co-captains. You guys are still friends today. That's so amazing. Still friends today. Yeah. He went on to uh, University of Washington. Okay. And in fact, he was uh, all packed. 12 at the time wow. uh, as a tackle for the University of Washington. Yeah. I know you had dreamed of going to the Naval Academy or something. Well, what happened was I um, was selected as a recipient for a Naval ROTC scholarship and had been accepted at the University of Pennsylvania, which had an NROTC program. And so that was where I was headed. And then, lo and behold, broke my knee playing football in um, high school. And then, of course, the Navy didn't want a guy with a bum knee. And 
there went the scholarships. So, and then, so I couldn't afford the tuition at the Pennsylvania, right. so I ended yeah. up going to the University of Hawaii. Right, and you also were running for the Olympics too in judo, weren't you? Or trying to? Well, I like I like to think it was a, a strong possibility that was lost. Um, in those days, uh, there was a state tournament to determine the representatives for each weight division to go compete in the nationals. And uh, the, guy, I, the guy that I lost to in the state tournament when I was younger, say a, a year prior, um, went on to take the Hawaii State Championship and he went on to the Nationals and I think he took the U.S. title and went on to the Olympics. I can't tell you how well he did in the Olympics. In 1964, the Olympics were held in Tokyo and the whole country gets to introduce the sport. So Japan introduced judo and so it was the first year for judo in the Olympics and I think he, he he meddled, but I don't know whether where he was in that. Right. But I and my instructor, my sensei, felt that I could have taken him, <laughs> except for that same broken knee, which kept me out of uh, uh, NROTC, also you kept me out of that. Your so, sensei must have been so mad. Oh, well, you know, life happens. <laughs> His dreams crushed. Dreams crushed. There you go. So fast forward, you've been dating mom in high school. That is correct. It's it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. And I actually she she invited me to her junior prom, and she claims because she went to a Catholic school. We only had twenty six students, four of which were boys. The rest were girls. And uh, so she desperately needed a date for her junior prom. <laughs> so it was like a mercy invitation. It was a mercy invitation. <laughs> so you guys dated a couple of years and you were married with two kids by the age of what, 20? Well, we got married in between our freshman and sophomore years in college. So, uh, I think when you were born, I was 20. So you and I are 20 years apart. Mm -hmm. Mom was 19. My sister followed 11 months later because we're Irish. Correct. Correct. So you had a family of four to support and you were trying to put yourself through college. Right, so it was uh, a time of very little sleep. I uh, would get up in the morning, of course. I, had, uh, I, had a, I was a full-time student at the University of Hawaii. Went to classes from, say, 8 to somewhere between noon and 1. Mm -hmm. I would rush home, grab a bite to eat. Then I had a full-time job that started at 3. I worked from 3 to midnight. And so... It, I'm doing your homework, Dad. Well, when you get home at midnight, before you, you can't just crash immediately. So I would grab a snack, do my homework, then you go to sleep, and you repeat the process. And then this particular company uh, always needed me to work. So on the weekends, so I would work Saturdays as well. And then because we didn't make a lot of money, I also played music in a in a group. We played at a nightclub. I played bass, and so we'd have to rehearse on Sundays. And then, of course, we'd play Friday night and Saturday night. <laughs> There's no time, no sleep. Uh, time. <laughs> there was very little time. There was no play time, I can tell you that. Oh my God, you must have been exhausted. When you graduated from college, it must have felt so good because you had more time in your life, I would think. Oh, without a doubt. And so I told myself I would never again, ever, open a textbook for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> oh my gosh. So you eventually got into a sales job, right? Um, I did. The company I was working for 
while going through college um, was called HC and D in Hawaii, and they were into the ready mix concrete business, and they owned a quarry that provided all the aggregate they needed for the ready mix concrete. They uh, made concrete block, uh, pipe, concrete pipe for drainage and all that. They did a lot of things, big company. And at uh, one point in time, they were purchased by another company from California called Amaron. Amaron had businesses all over the world, and one of which was in Bogota, Colombia. And so when I got my degree, I made an appointment to visit with the vice president at HCMD to ask his help in getting me a position with the parent company, Amaron, in Bogota, Colombia. Because at the time, I my thought was that I was going to go to work for the U.S. State Department in the consular service. And one of the requirements was that you be fluent in a, another language. Mm -hmm. And since I had a little bit of Spanish, I thought, well, if I could get posted to Bogota, Colombia, not only would it be fun living in a foreign country, sure. but I could become fluent in Spanish. And so this vice president looked at me, his name was Jack Burford, by the way, and he said, son, they shoot people in, especially Americans in Bogota, Colombia. He says, we've got jobs here that you could, what do you want to do? Let me help you find a job here with our company. And so it was with his uh, support that I ended up in sales at that same company, HCMD. So I tell mom, it was funny, I went to visit him on a Thursday. And uh, after I visited Jack Burford, he set me up to visit with the vice president in the sales, who set me up with the sales manager. When I walked out of the sales manager's office, I was a sales rep. I had a car, company car. <laughs> I had a job. And all these thoughts of going to Bogota, Colombia were gone. That changed the trajectory of your whole life. It did. Oh my God. How did you end up? I don't know why you keep. I remember this dynamite story. Well, because the company HCD operated a quarry, mm -hmm. they needed dynamite to blast the rocks out of the mountain. They were drilling and blasting the mountain to get the mm -hmm. aggregate. And the explosives they used came from the EI DuPont company. And we were such a large consumer of dynamite from EI DuPont company that we ended up being their local distributor for DuPont explosives in the state of Hawaii. And HCMD asked me to be the sales rep for DuPont. So you were selling dynamite? I was selling dynamite. So what happened? Why did you end up with all this dynamite that you had to get rid of? The, oh, <laughs> well, that's a long story. They, you know, the Hawaii on the island of Oahu um, had blasted a set of tunnels through the Ko'olau Range to make traveling from Honolulu to Kailua, which is on the other side of the island, easier and quicker. Right. And they did that in the 50s. And then they needed another set of tunnels to help people that live on the windward side get to work at Pearl Harbor. And the tunnels through the poly were just getting congested. It was just taking forever. And so they decided to build a new set of tunnels. And so they, the state of Hawaii put it out for bid. The contractor got it. And I was successful in selling that contractor on buying DuPont explosives to blast those tunnels. Sure. Well, then the environmentalists came in, and then the Hawaiian cultural people came in and sued and stopped the project. In the interim, we had ordered an entire shipload of dynamite from DuPont 
on the out of the Washington, Seattle, Washington. Oh, that was on the way. Washington. Boat was coming, and here we had a whole boatload of explosives, and the project was put on indefinite hold. And it was rather a scary thing. Think of that. I was a very young man at the time. Yeah, how old were you? In your 20s? Uh, yeah, late 20s, probably. Um, and a boatload of explosives. And the president of HCND and all his vice presidents sitting at this huge conference table, and me on the other end, being chewed out <laughs> for getting this whole boatload of explosives. Oh, okay. God. What are we going to do with that? And in fact, it was interesting because the same vice president, Jack Burford, finally slammed his pad on the table and jumped up and told the president, look, you're chewing on this young boy, and you know, and I know, he didn't have the authority to order a vote of explosives. One of us did. So don't pick on him. <laughs> And so they politely asked me to leave the room while they chewed it out. <laughs> but the bottom line was... It's dynamite. But the bottom line was they gave me 12 months to sell oh. a boatload of explosives. God. And so we did. You got rid of it. Well, except for about 100 pounds, two boxes, which I surreptitiously dumped into the Pacific Ocean <laughs> at the end of 12 months. <laughs> so I could honestly go back to the president's office, which I did, and swear on a stack of Bibles, which I did not, but I swear. <laughs> the dynamite was gone. Every last case is oh, gone. Oh, my God, Dad. That's so funny. So when did you have time to start, like, this golf club that you started, the Withers Golf Club? How did that come into it? Well, I, very early on, I found out that... Uh, Construction in Hawaii is largely a golfer's industry. All the construction people were into golf. Not and only them, but the, all the inspectors, the state inspectors. And city, drinking, too. Huh? Drinking. Wow, the 1920s well, is, is always fun. <laughs> and, and I had never taken any lessons. I mean, I was terrible. I didn't even really play golf. Right. And yet I wanted, I found out that the company, HCMD, since I was in sales, if I were to play golf with a customer, the company would pay for the green fees and all of that. So I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I looked around at the various golf clubs and I was really too embarrassed to join any of them because those guys were real golfers and I was, I was terrible. And so I thought... In talking with all of my customers, I found out that there were a whole lot of people just like me that wanted to play golf but were terrible. Right. And so I started a little golf club for terrible golfers, and I called it the Whiffers Club. Oh, you know, when you swing and miss, it's called a whiff. Right. And so I went around and recruited these customers of mine to join my Whiffers Golf Club. And I finally got... 16 of us, so four foursomes. That's good. And uh, got the tea times and all that kind of stuff, and we started going. And, you know, <laughs> I was still in my maybe my late 20s at the time, and this grew into quite an organization. They, uh, everybody at one point wanted to become a member of the Whiffers. In fact, we had to set a limit. I set a limit, 40 members. That was it. And if you wanted to join, you had to go on a waiting list. Oh, my gosh. And uh, it's, I, I was just talking to a friend not too long ago, uh, retired now, but he tells me that the Whiffers is still going on, still going strong. That's amazing, Dad. After all these years. It'd be cool to go back to Hawaii and... and you know, hook up and go, I started this back, way back when. Isn't that funny? That would be interesting. Amazing. That's so cool. So it must have been really good for business for you to, you know, it, to it was. Kind of connections outside of work, kind of a, a networking thing. It, it was. It, oh, uh, it was very, very helpful because 
you really get to learn about a person and his personality. On the on golf course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly. It knocks down a lot of barriers. Exactly. So things must have been getting a little better financially because you started to kind of find your footing in sales. Mom got a job when I was four. So things yeah. have been getting a, a, a little bit better for you financially. It got a little bit better, yeah. And, and your mom, you know, eventually ended up working for Xerox. She, I think she must have been one of the first female Xerox sales reps in the country. Yeah, she's and, not rock star. I'm talking to her next. So we'll look at her full story. Well, it wasn't very long before she was out earning me by bunches. So she was, she was, <laughs> she was the primary breadwinner. But yeah, absolutely. And you follow your pride, her dad, and take hey, it. You all went in the same pot, so there was no pride involved. That's right. That's right. She, she is uh, pretty remarkable. I'm well, inspired by both of you, actually. We've both done very well. So you decided, um, I know you were working for a company named Avanti. You eventually left HCND and then you transitioned to a company that it was kind of a short lived um, role for you, I think, right? Well, one of the customers I had when I was in sales at HCND mm -hmm. and also one of my earliest recruits for the golf club that I started were these two gentlemen that owned a company called Avanti Constructors. Mm -hmm. And Avanti Construction was uh, involved in building highways and what they call heavy utilities. Um, they were a heavy construction company. And at the time, they wanted to diversify. They didn't want all of their eggs in one heavy construction basket. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get into commercial buildings. And at the time, Butler Manufacturing Company, uh, metal buildings uh, manufacturer, very large, worldwide in fact, headquartered in Kansas City, were looking for a representative which they used local contractors as the representatives. Someone to represent them in Hawaii. And Avanti Constructors was being considered and but they needed someone to start up and then run this new division they were setting up and so they asked me if i'd be interested and at the time i was a concrete guy i knew nothing about steel mm -hmm. steel buildings or commercial buildings but being young and foolish i said sure why not and so that's what happened. Oh my gosh. And then through that connection, we ended up relocating to Beaverton, Oregon. Exactly. Uh, uh, I represented uh, Butler Manufacturing Company mm -hmm. uh, for Avanti mm -hmm. several years and got to know the Butler people quite well. So much so that when they needed someone to manage the Pacific Northwest for them, they asked if I'd be interested in doing that, and I said, sure. And so that's when we moved to uh, Beaverton, Oregon. What was that like for you, Dad? You'd never lived away from home. Well, I mean, besides when you were little. Yeah. Um, was that an adjustment for you, getting used to living on the mainland? Going it, was a, it was a huge adjustment. It was actually, obviously, a joint decision with your mom being a big part of that because mm -hmm. she had to want to do it or we wouldn't, wouldn't have gone. Right. But at the time, you know, we are both looking for a change. Uh, mm -hmm. Thought it would be interesting. We thought it would give you folks, as uh, I think you were like, I don't know, 12, 13 maybe, mm -hmm. uh, better opportunities if we grew up on the mainland rather than growing up in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. and so for those reasons, we decided to go take the risk. All of these are risky decisions, right? <laughs> so, well, sh shoot the dice and, and take a chance. And it, it seemed to have worked out. I know. It, it seems like the younger you are, the easier it is to, to make those decisions. Well, it is. You know, if you fall on your face, you're still young enough to start again. 
Yeah, yeah. And then there's a little bit of just naivete too. Like Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. About it. You know, you just kinda of go. go. Well when you're young you're bulletproof, right? We can Absolutely. Absolutely. So you ended up in Oregon for a little bit of time and I know you were favored and kind of followed this corporate you climbed that corporate ladder, corporate ladder climbing, climbing, ended up in um, Kansas City, where the corporate headquarters was eventually. All the while, you were still um, golfing, right? Enjoy. Oh, yeah. Still <laughs> golfing poorly, mind you. What's golfing? <laughs> You're still golfing. Yeah. Yeah. Poorly. Me. <laughs> um, but you got us off to college. You guys moved to Kansas City. That must have been an exciting time. It was. And, and what was exciting about it was the position that they offered me at that point that uh, enticed us to Kansas City was to be their international marketing manager. And uh, it was in that position that I was responsible for developing what they called Butler Builders, these local contractors to represent Butler, uh, not in the U.S. in this case, of course, but in all over the world. And so we had Butler Builders in Asia, all over Asia, all of, I set them up, all over the Caribbean, uh, uh, Central America, Mexico. Um, you yeah. had a pretty extensive... I think you showed me a collection of all your passports at one time. It was like a box full because you built so much. Well, they they fill up, you know. They couldn't expand them anymore. They'd have to give you. Just, uh, you were on a pretty intense travel schedule. What was your schedule? Well, uh, because it was worldwide, you know, I I fly out to the Far East and spend you know a minimum of two weeks, more like three weeks, traveling in Asia visiting uh, our dealers in that area, and then come back to Kansas City, and then I'd fly down into the Caribbean and Central America, and I'd be there gone for two or three weeks, and then back. Um, um, Middle East, I think? Oh, Middle East was a big area for us. That's exactly right. We had a plant in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and we had dealers in Egypt, in uh, Saudi, of course, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, um, Oman. Um, yeah, how did you find all these individual builders? This is before the internet. How did you know who to call on? How did you even begin to uh, connect? With well, it, local it, was it was interesting because uh, you're right. We didn't have all the modern communication technology. And so what I would do would be to contact the uh, U.S. Embassy or consulate, mm -hmm. usually the embassy, and mm -hmm. talk to the U.S. commercial attaché. Fortunately, Butler Manufacturing was a pretty well-known company. So when I introduced myself and said Butler, they kind of knew uh, who we were. Mm -hmm. and I was telling them we're looking to expand into that area, looking for a local general contractor to represent us. And then that commercial attaché provided me with a list of uh, contractors that I might consider contacting. And then I began contacting, do it by uh, telephone, which was a challenge because of time differences, but also with what they call a telex. We had a telex. You had a telex operator, you had to draft your message, they sent it, and all that kind of stuff. Like a telegram, kind of? Like they type kinda, it? Kind of, sort of, but not really a telegram. But yeah, it was a pretty cumbersome way to communicate, but that's how we did it. Wow, that's incredible. And then I would fly in and make an appointment and visit with these suggested contractors and then have to make a decision which one I wanted to work with. And uh, then it was my job then to train them. So very often I'd end up bringing their representative back to Kansas City to train in our schools. Which Did we you have to... translators? Because they don't speak the language. Uh, one of the prereqs was that they speak English. Okay. At least uh, the guy that I was going to deal with had to right. speak English. Right. Gosh, you must have had contacts all over the world. 
Oh yeah, one time, yeah, I could have been comfortable anywhere. Drop me, I could have called someone and had a fine dinner with someone. <laughs> What's amazing too is I think because of your nationality blend, you really can fit anywhere. One of, the, one of the really good things is if you look at me, I mean, I don't look like your typical six foot tall, blonde, blue eyed American. Right. And so I, I never stood out in the crowd, which in my case was really quite helpful. I it kind of broke some barriers down probably for you. I think so, yeah. And then let's be honest, everybody loves Hawaii. So as soon yeah. as you say from Hawaii, you know, uh, everybody's friendly. It's an icebreaker. It is. An icebreaker. Did you ever have moments when you thought to yourself, I couldn't have dreamed this life up? I mean, you come oh. from such, I mean, humble poverty, literally poverty. Yeah. You know, it must have been something when you finally realized, I'm literally traveling all over the world. This is incredible. It's like, incredible. World. And I then, do it. And then mom was able, because of my travel schedule, we could coordinate so that she could schedule her vacations to coincide with one of my trips so that she could join me. And mm -hmm. so as a consequence, mom was able to drive, I mean, fly with me to all over the Far East, the Caribbean, of course, Europe. Of course, we lived in Europe. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. That's, a, that's, a whole, that's the next chapter. So eventually... How did this opportunity in Europe come? You guys ended up living in Europe for five years as an expat. Well, um, Butler had a wholly owned subsidiary company in Europe and had set up their European headquarters and their manufacturing, European manufacturing plant in Scotland, in Edinburgh area. And um, I was asked, the, the gentleman who was running it was retiring, and so I was asked if I'd be interested in becoming president of Butler Europe, and that, of course, entailed relocating to uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, what was that like for you? They must have, I mean, of course, there was... Uh, Talk about one of the most beautiful countries and your beloved golf opportunity. <laughs> golf opportunity. <laughs> great. This is what's happening, right? <laughs> but it's kind of ironic when you look at mom and me, we could fit in pretty comfortably in most parts of the world, Asia, Latin America, of course, all anywhere in the U.S. But we kind of stood out. <laughs> like a sore thumb in Scotland with all the redheads and blondes and blue eyes there. Oh my god. Yeah. Well, I know as soon as you got there, I think it maybe it was shortly thereafter, mom ended up contacting all of the consul general's wives and creating this incredible international women's or she, she's pretty phenomenal and it's pretty much she, she is. Uh, so well, the first thing she did was join the American Women's Club, and then she ended up becoming president of the American Women's Club. Of there. course. <laughs> and, but as a consequence of that position, we got to know um, a lot of the uh, consul generals for all the various countries that resided and worked in Edinburgh. Edinburgh is like the capital of Scotland. Right. And so that's where all the consulates are. That's where your banking headquarters and the University of Edinburgh. What great connections you must have made. You must have made so many, met so many interesting diplomats and right from all different backgrounds, different cultures. That must have been incredible for you guys. And so through that, mom began to meet these various wives of the various consul generals from Europe and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they were all just looking to find friends. Sure. And so mom started this organization for all of these women. <laughs> and that organization is still going on. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah. Probably through that, you probably met the husbands, right? Because they oh, yes, yes. You know, functions and things like that, I would think, at some point. Correct. 
where the husbands could meet. And well, in fact, we spent so much time with that group that uh, a lot of folks in Edinburgh actually thought Mom and I were attached to the U.S. consulate, you know, as employees. Yeah, that must have been great. Great time for you. Great time. I know your job was super stressful, but the opportunity to live abroad for five years, I know you guys traveled extensively through Europe. Yeah, well, plus mom took the time, the opportunity to get her master's uh, there at the University of Edinburgh as well. So. I, I can't wait to talk about her story on our, our interview, um, which is coming up next. But you guys have had quite a life. I mean, you had so many odds against you. First of all, your socioeconomic situation growing up. You know, right. you came from a family of seven. You were a family of four, single mom. Right. Um, from the 50s, right? Late 50s, maybe? Right. Well, actually five, because my cousin was living with us. Oh, right. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was some, you know, financial hardship. It wasn't like you had a silver spoon in your mouth. Well, it was so bad, actually, that uh, I couldn't buy football shoes to play high school football. So the coach actually found a pair of shoes for me. Wow. My judo uh, sensei got, found me a judo gi because I couldn't afford that either. So, yeah, it was tough. You did have some powerful mentors in your life, though, in your that looked out for you, like your coaches and your judo instructor. You had some very positive male influences in your life. Correct. I've been blessed for really. you. Yeah, yeah. And a, a very strong family. The Hawaiian culture is so strong in family values and coming together. Well, I don't think people give my mom, your grandmother, enough credit for uh, holding everything together when my dad died. Yeah, she was young, right? Yeah. yeah. And she had to go back to work. Yeah. It wasn't a, a common thing for women to work at that time. It was, it was tough. Yeah. But she did. Was she a secretary or a teacher? What did she end up doing to... Well, she, she worked for a while at a, um, a clothing store and then subsequently went to work for the y, YMCA. And, and she retired from the YMCA. Right. So that was perfect because it was in the same town. Yeah. And um, she was a secretary there. Right. She was pretty remarkable. She had, she had great discipline, great right. disciplinarian, and um, encouraged you, I know, to get your degree. I think you were the first person in your family to get a college degree. Well, from the immediate family, I wasn't the first in the family. I had two older cousins, both uh, girls that uh, beat me to it on the college degree, but I was number three anyway. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I just think you and mom had a lot of adversity because you were married so young, you had children right away, you had to really um, fight for and earn every opportunity that came to both of you. I really want to acknowledge you for how far and how much you achieved coming from such a humble, humble background, you know? It was not easy, I'm sure. It was a challenge. Yeah, and then my, you know, Tammy and I weren't a picnic either. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, two, you two were great, you were young. <laughs> but anyway, so you ended up being in Europe for five years, which is pretty incredible, I know you, I would say probably for mom, that was probably the best five years of her life. She certainly enjoyed it. We both did. Yeah. Yeah, even though work for you was incredibly stressful. And then you came back to um, United States and Kansas City and um, finished out your career. And now you guys are retired. What's, what's it like? What was it like for you um, retiring? Were you, do you have a hard time adjusting to that, Dad? Uh, adjusting to retirement? Yeah, I mean, are you kidding? identities tied to this executive. This Abs absolutely not. I love retirement. I loved it from the first day. Really? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? It's great. That's awesome. I know a lot of people miss 
the, the you know work that people in associations and meetings and challenges. Uh, I, I didn't. I was happy to retire. I'm delighted in retirement. That's awful. You guys are living in a beautiful retirement community now in California, enjoying the amazing weather, golfing, you know, sounds like it was the best move for you guys ever. Well, it kind of feels like you're on a perpetual cruise ship. You know, your biggest <laughs> challenges every day is choosing what activity to do or not do. Nice. Yeah, never have to cook. It's a, it's, it's wonderful. a beautiful place, too. It, it's like a resort. It is. So I'm glad you guys have been able to create that for yourselves. I um, just want to tell you, I admire you so much for having overcome so much adversity in your early life and achieving so much. Did you always have that internal ambition and drive? I mean, was there something always kind of pushing you to take things to the next level and to want to elevate and, you know, what was it? Was it an thing, a cultural thing? Uh, I don't know. I, I think a part of it was, uh, one of my flaws, I think, is I hate to lose, as you know. <laughs> I know. But, but, but that's <laughs> in everything. That's including life. It, I always had to be the best. And so whether it was in a card game Playing you. Playing Scrabble. Uh, playing Scrabble and getting crushed. <laughs> Which we play every day. Uh, but no, but it, in work, if I was going to be in sales, I wanted to be the best. If I was, whatever I was doing, it had to be the best. Or that's I was, from, or from when you were a child? If you were I, I think it's, it's in the DNA. I, I don't know if you learned that. I, it seemed like I've always been that way. Um, Not served you well. Well, it, it, it makes you try hard, put it that way, and, and settling for second best. The other thing you have to learn, you have to learn, and I think I've done that, you learn to be a gracious winner, but you also learn to be a gracious loser. You know, I mean, you fight like hell when you compete. But win or lose, you have to be, you have to be nice about it. And I think that's yeah. Although I have to say, when you beat me at Scrabble, Dad, I can feel your, your bliss and glee. Ah, uh, like your excitement comes to the <laughs> the game. <laughs> I tried to hide it. My phone. <laughs> I can tell you're like, yes, I'm here again. <laughs> Speaking of which, you're crushing me on this last oh, game. So. I'm crushing you right now. It feels pretty good. But um, anyway, so I'm just gonna. We're getting pretty close to the end here. But I, I always like to ask my guests if you could share something, some words of wisdom that helped you, you know, get to this point, get through some of the adversity that you've been through in your life, what, what, would, you, what would that advice be? Oh, I don't know if it's, it's certainly not original, but uh, I always believe that you should always, always shoot for the stars. And in trying to accomplish that, even if you fall a wee bit short, it'll still be a very, very high accomplishment. So don't be afraid to go for it mm -hmm. and, uh, and give it all you've got. Right. Never be afraid to take a chance or a risk. As you going through this, there's <laughs> been a lot of risky choices in our yeah. life. Yeah. But take a chance and go for it. Yeah. You never know. If you don't, if you don't go for it, you're, you're limiting yourself, right? Correct. So that's excellent advice. Well, Dad, it has been awesome interviewing you today for my show. Thanks so much for, for joining me today. And for all of you that tuned in, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with my dad, Nelson Markle. Um, if this resonates with you, I hope you'll subscribe, like, and share to my YouTube channel. And uh, I encourage y'all to be kind to yourself and have an amazing day. Thank you.